All right. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, this is the final seminar for the, the year, for the academic year for the Western Center for Agricultural Health and Safety. And I'm really happy to have you with us today. Next slide, please. Before we get started, I'm just going to repeat a few housekeeping items. The seminar is being recorded, which means we'll be able to post it on YouTube tomorrow in English and Spanish for others to uh, watch. All participants are muted, so please use the chat feature in order to ask questions. Um, we will have time at the end of the presentation to, um, to interact with the speakers. And as Amelia said, the Spanish interpretation feature has been turned on, and so please either choose English or Spanish from the interpretation language selection below. And lastly, closed captioning is available and you can select the CC icon below and click show subtitles to um, have that feature. Next slide. For those who may not know us, the Western Center for Agricultural Health and Safety has a mission to improve the health and safety of agricultural workers in the West through innovative research, interactive trainings and tailored outreach. And one way that we seek to engage partners and um, researchers, farmers, workers across the region is through this seminar series. And so um, we're really happy that you're here with us today. Next slide. With that, it's my pleasure to introduce um, Nathan and Antonio from ALBA, the Agriculture and Land-Based Training Association. They're going to talk about their feed program and implementing workplace safety at their workplaces. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to them to share screen and get us started. Well, hi, everybody. Nathan Harkle Road. Can you hear me OK? Awesome. And I'm here with my colleague, Antonio Acosta, and I'm going to share my screen. Give me one second. Perfect. Um, okay, can everybody see my screen okay? Awesome. All right. Well, um, again, we are the Agriculture and Land-Based Training Association, or ALBA. If you don't know, ALBA means DAWN in Spanish, which is a very fitting um, acronym because we are a place of new beginnings for our participants. And we're here to talk about our FEED program, which stands for Farmer Education Enterprise Development. Um, as you can see, you do have to have good acronyms in this business. Okay, well, who are we? What do we do? Um, ALBA is a very special place. I know I'm biased, but it truly is. Um, we have 100 flat acres in the heart of the Salinas Valley, the Salad Bowl of America, where at different times of the year, we grow over 80 to 90% of the nation's lettuce. There's no shortage of farm workers. Um, there's up to 175,000 farm workers every year working in the in Monterey County agriculture. So the land that we're on has a history of going back to the 1970s of helping farm workers start their own independent farm businesses. So these are people that are working for other farms in the bigger industry that want to go on and do something on their own. Um, in the 70s, there were some efforts around helping strawberry farm workers, mainly pickers. Um, develop into production cooperatives. Um, and that lasted for a decade or so. And then it slowly evolved into what we have now. Um, and the program structure has been the same since about the 1970s. ALBA was founded in 2001, but organization was built on a, you know, a history of other organizations doing similar kind of work. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you today about our main program. In fact, we really only have one program, which is the feed program. And uh, it has two parts, okay? So the first part is what we call our farmer education course, which is an experiential learning opportunity for those that wanna start a farm. And then the second part of the program is what we call organic farm incubator. We're actually lease land out to participants. So I'll go into more detail on that in just a second. Okay, so if you wanna get started at ALBA, you're gonna start in our farmer education course. Again, there's no shortage of farm workers in our area. People are coming by every week, interested in um, learning more about what we do, wanting to sign up and get started. We collect a list, it's ongoing, and then 
we start a cohort um, each year in October and it runs for the entire year. So the PEPA, oh, we also call it PEPA in Spanish, I should say, Programa Educativo para Agricultores. Um, so it's a very special opportunity where we bring together these farm workers. That's about three quarters of the class. And the other quarter is a mix of college students from our local community college down the road, Hartnell College. And those are ag production students um, that want to get electives. The whole course is accredited by the local college. So we're effectively an outreach arm for the college to reach farm worker communities. Um, we'll get about 30 people enrolled in the course at the beginning. And then we travel along this experience together. Um, and the course is divided into five distinct modules. Everyone's really excited about planting, putting seeds in the ground, uh, things of that nature. But uh, lo and behold, there's a lot more to farming than that. So we cover things such as soil health and crop planning, but a big emphasis on business management. A lot of our farmers become good producers quickly, but where they struggle is business. Included in that is regulations, which is why we're here today. We have an eight-week-long module on marketing. In the peak of the summer, we have our organic production module. We're actually farming a half acre together as a class. From start to finish, uh, we'll grow five to 10 crops over the course of the year um, and learn about pest management, um, fertility, irrigation management. And then our final module is really the ramp up to launching a farm. We call it farm planning. Some people call it boot camp because it's the chance to really, um, you know, buckle down and get ready for um, something that's going to be demanding in a lot of ways. Um, Nathan, yeah. can I um, ask you to slow down just a tiny bit for our interpreters? Oh, you bet. Wow. Awesome. Thank you so much. It's so rare. I, I get told I talk too fast. All right. <laughs> that's fine. Um, now, uh, since we're working with farm workers and most of those folks are immigrants from Mexico, uh, we do offer the class in Spanish. Um, usually, you know, 90% plus of the class is Spanish speaking preference. We have monolingual Spanish speakers, bilingual people, and occasionally in some years, a couple of English speakers. Um, so when we have English speakers, we do exactly what um, Linguistica is doing right now. We'll use simultaneous interpretation. We have a an interpreter that we work with too. So anyhow, that's the class. We start with 30. It's a big funnel, okay? Uh, about 25 will fully matriculate and about 15 to 20 will graduate, meaning they completed the whole series uh, with good grades. And we push them. This class is not necessarily easy, especially if you don't have a lot of experience in formal education. But the, the irony is that our farm workers usually get the better grades than the, you know, the few people that are college educated that are coming back to study because they're taking it, not to say college educated people don't take things seriously, but the farm workers have a, a dream and idea in mind and it's a viable opportunity for them. Okay, so when you graduate from the farmer education course, you can then qualify to apply and lease land in our organic farm incubator. And a lot of you may have heard this incubation term before and like the tech world, startup world, this is the farming version of that. So um, the low tech version. The basic idea of the incubator is that we provide a supportive, reduced risk, reduced cost environment for people to get started. Um, you know, working with people that have limited resources, the average income of families coming into our program is about $36,000 per year, which doesn't go very far in Monterey County. And, and most of California. But anyhow, uh, we get them started on a half acre in their first year. We subsidize the land. We have equipment that we lease out at a subsidized rate. All those subsidies go down over the course of four years, which is the time frame of the incubator. And then each year they can scale up a little bit in acreage, um, going from a half acre in year one to up to two acres in year two. And by the time they're in their fourth year in the incubator, they can be on five or six acres, depending on their desire to grow, and really how they're performing. So we do actually evaluate their performance and make sure they're achieving milestones that uh, move them towards being independent. Because at the end of the day, our measure of success is people staying with us, leaving, and continuing to farm. So really the hallmark of what we do um, is the intensive one-on-one -on -one technical assistance. 
So we have staff on hand. We're a small, humble organization of 11, but we have staff on hand that are dedicated and help farmers with things such as production and market access. We actually connect farmers to different marketing opportunities. And then the big one, that's why we're here, regulatory compliance. So we actually have a team of two and a half, we'll say, that works on compliance, and that's organic certification, food safety, and worker safety, and some other licenses and permits. Um, and then we have a farm team that helps people with learning how to use the tractors and implements and the irrigation system. Now, we're just a small organization, and we've learned we can't do everything ourselves. Okay. So what we can't do ourselves, we outsource. And as you'll see, it takes a village to uh, create a farmer, to build this pipeline, which is so important because, you know, the average age of a farmer in this country is in the low 60s. And I think there's more interest in food than ever before. It's certainly more interest in organic agriculture, but the reality is that people are not lining up to be farmers. So what we do is important. And the folks that are coming to us are incredibly hardworking. They have a passion for the land. They have historically, you know, been farmers in Mexico before they come here to work in California agriculture. And they have, you know, a lot to gain from by, by doing it. Um, we're trying to use our land base to help people get closer to a middle-class income. Um, so they have a better livelihood. Yeah, that was a little bit of divergence, but um, yes, a village. This is what we do. We subsidize the land. We provide the education and technical assistance. Plan year one is our farmer education course. And then pilot to transition is the incubator. And maturity is when they leave the incubator. Uh, we work with a cooler that helps market our farmer's products. Farmers are free to market their product wherever they want, but a lot go to Coke Farms. Uh, they're basically a food hub that works with small uh, Latinx farmers and other BIPOC farmers. FarmLink helps our farmers connect with loans and uh, connect with land opportunities. The Kitchen Table Advisors provides one-on-one -on -one business coaching. And then we have other partners like the Resource Conservation District. Um, we do digital literacy, ag supervisor and leadership skills, and so on and so on. Always trying to round the program out as we learn and network. That's why we're here, to network. So quickly... Um, a bit on our impact over the years. We had a big impact assessment. Uh, we collected data from, let's see, from 2001 to 2022 um, in terms of the participants. We've had, at that point, we had about four or 500 and we got in touch with 181. And a surprising number launched the farm, 121 did of that group that we surveyed. And we actually account for over 35% of the organic farmers in Monterey, Santa Cruz, and San Benito counties. So that's your cocktail trivia for the evening. Um, those that didn't go on a farm, by and large, went back into the workforce. I'm going to glaze over this slide. I don't want to take time away from my colleague. But uh, the first chart really shows how much um, you know the Latino groups kind of dominate our program. Um, over 50% Mexican immigrants, and then... The vast majority after that being U.S. born Latinos, but we do accept people from all backgrounds. We do ask that people have some kind of relevant farming experience, though. We're not a place to start from zero, zero. Got to have something to share. Um, and then interestingly, those that were um, Mexican immigrants made more of their household income from the farm than some of the other groups, as you can see. And then if you boil it down, you know, we're trying to take our land base to help people get ahead economically. And then there's lots of social benefits too that I don't have time to talk about, but um, really it's about helping people, you know, increase their oper economic opportunities. And you can see that, you know, before doing the program, this chart shows before coming to ALBA and after ALBA. And, you know, there's a lot of people that were low earners, right? Below the poverty line here. Um, brown and then those numbers after alba decrease then the flip side is you get kind of into that more middle class salary range um you see increases so there were fewer and the brown i should turn on my do i have the little pointer on here 
I don't, do I? Okay. Yeah, we see, we see you moving your cursor. Oh, you do? Okay, yep. perfect. Oops, did not mean to do that. Okay, so uh, yeah, you can see that the percentage of people making more money increases um, after Alba. All right, and then, you know, simple pie chart about Alba improving people's career opportunities. Um, and most people, an overwhelming majority said yes or somewhat. And most people said that their careers were much better or better. So we're pretty proud of our impact. This is just a snippet. Uh, we have, this is a full, very robust study, but um, yeah, we are having impact in the local community. So how do we get here to talk in front of you guys? Well, you know, we've been involved in helping farmers with regulatory challenges since, since Alba started. Um, we've always been focused on organic agriculture. And of course there's organic certification and rules and regulations that go along with that. We used to think that was hard from 2001 to 2011. We thought organic certification was so hard and then food safety came around and that really started to dominate and, you know, represent a major, major set of hurdles for farmers to get there. But you know what? They did it and they continue to do it. And we were early adopters and that helped open opportunities for farmers. And not to say we got that part all figured out, but, um, you know, with the help of Antonio in particular, we've really come a long, long ways. And so anyhow, we're always thinking about what's next. And, you know, the last seven or eight years, we've taken, dipped our toes into doing worker safety types of trainings with our farmers. We always did to a limited extent, but we've been slowly expanding it. Um, and that's how we got involved with the Western Center here. But uh, yeah, we've had projects in the past where we helped, one, revise our own IIPP, Injury and Illness Prevention Plan, and develop templates for farmers. We had a whole project focused on children's safety on farms. Um, and then through the, this COVID opportunity, through Heather, thank you, Heather, in the Western Center, we've been able to expand into that topic and build on top of that and add OSHA and a whole range of other uh, types of trainings. That's an area that we want to keep expanding in because it's essential. All right, um, this is my transition slide to Antonio, who's going to get a little more into the weeds on how we do what we do. But um, we do have a, an approach that we've developed that includes the bilingual training culturally appropriate. Um, we have lots of people on staff that are from the community that can put these trainings into the words that our participants understand. We always try to keep it hands-on when we can, and we're learning how to do that better and better each year. The nice thing about us is we have a captive audience for a number of years, right? So we don't have to lay everything on our farmers on day one. We can slowly reveal what they need to do, help them along baby steps, but they make steady progress. Um, and all the farmers are literally on our footstep when we leave the office <laughs> right around us. So it makes interactions super easy. And it's all about repetition. You know, the average adult has to hear something seven times before they master it. I have to hear something 20 times, put it in perspective. Um, and I love the, I love to think of it as like the Bruce Lee approach. And you can read the quote there if you like. Okay, Antonio. You just tell me when you want me to advance the slides, okay? Oh, I don't think we can hear you. Thanks, Nathan. Uh, pretty much our approach, we have a different, we always look for different strategies to contact um, the farmers and kind of do our best to give the best work, workshops we can. Um, one of our strategies that we like to use is to share what's going on around our county before we actually start a workshop. Um, and as well at a regular basis. There's times that we could be at our facility at Alba, and I could say for the past um, five, year, five years plus, we haven't had a, um, an accident in our farm. And I will say this because um, we do conduct uh, um, daily inspections with the farmers, and we're observing as well they're being careful, but it doesn't mean that you have to think, that, okay, you know, it's been good so far, there's no risk, let's, not be on our guard no more. So we always like to tell farmers about what's going on, what we hear. Um, here, one, two, and three on the, on the PowerPoint slide, uh, you can see that in 2010, a man was run over by a tractor. 
2020, a man died who fell into equipment at a mushroom facility. 2018, a man was stuck by a big rig and pinned against a loading dock. And these are only a few examples that have happened here in Monterey County, just in our county, not the state, not, not around our, um, other counties around us. But I always like to remind farmers that um, before we start is that accidents do happen. And it's not just about let's have a workshop and sign the um, the the log and you're good to go. It's always a reminder, even though we haven't had um, accidents, we always try to tell them about anything we do here related here in Monterey County, the state or in the U.S. or even around the world. Like, hey, you know, um, this happened. Let's remind each other that let's avoid this from happiness for us. Uh, possibly um, somebody went to heat stroke, uh, not drinking enough water, not taking a break, not having the shade provided. It must have, it might have happened with our neighbors, and it's important that we share the news with the, uh, anybody we're working with, uh, so they could be on the alert. Like this could happen, even though it hasn't happened yet. We have to stay on our toes, um, twenty four seven. And kind of what we have for our mission for ALVA is our goal is to create safety culture at our farm to reduce and prevent injuries among farmers who try to ensure that everyone receives proper training to ensure they return safely home to their families. And ALVA, we just don't have farm workers. We have families that come on the weekends. Um, we have students who come. We have tours. Uh, we have elementary schools that show up to our farm. And... This, um, it's really important that we are keeping everybody safe. It starts with the farm worker, but we have to pass on the message that you could take these practices not only at the farm, but home as well. Can you change the slide, Nathan, please? And I will be conduct multiple trainings. We, con we, we conduct uh, a lot of trainings from tractor safety, heat illness, forklift, office hazards, Back safety, first day CPR, lockout, tag out, fire extinguishers, IPP injury, illness prevention program, pesticides, and much more. When we conduct all these trainings, we don't just rush through them. It's very important that we take our time with the farmers, that they're understanding. Like I mentioned before, I have seen and I've been around where well, there's uh, other industries that they're going to get inspected and they want to be in compliance, so they just have farmers sign in, sign in, sign in. And Alba, we want to make sure we're taking our time. Hey, what is tractor safety? Uh, do you do you fully understand? Can you give us an example of what you learned? Um, do you see the risk? What has happened before for not following these protocols? The forklift, the lockout, tagout. You know, for, even from the fire extinguisher. Do you know how to use a fire extinguisher in case of an emergency? Uh, pesticides, all these things we have to make sure farmers understand and and not just have the workshop and walk away. Uh, an example would be from our first day CPR training. We used to have a first day CPR training that was only 45 minutes long. Um, in reality, what can we learn in 45 minutes when it comes to first day CPR? Now we had teamed up with um, our one of our partners, Gosman, who um, his workshop is more detailed. It takes about four hours. And we had did a survey with the farmers and they see that, you know, it does matter when you take the time and explain in detail about any topic or workshop you want to have so they can fully understand. Next, Nathan. Um, one of the trainings that we have, we do on-site trainings. And this would be, this is on-site trainings. We do it in the in the uh, facility with our, our incubator farmers. We also do hands-on training with the farmers because we have realized that farmers sometimes they don't just want to sit there and watch a PowerPoint presentation. They want to have a hands-on and try out themselves. Like, hey, you know, um, let's have a PowerPoint presentation, but now let me see, go up in uh, uh with the team, and now you present what you learn in the group. Because it's very important that the farmers in, in Alba have the ability to conduct a training on their own or, they, or how they are in their own business. We just don't do trainings with the uh, incubator farmers. We also provide assistance outside of Alba um, as well to all the alumni farmers as well. 
And there, there, we also provide assistance to disadvantaged farmers. These are farmers who do not have funding or support. So with the grants that we have, we're able to reach out to any um, farmer who possibly does not have any funding to um, get the support they need or a consultant. When they come to us, we do our best to provide these services to them. Uh, one of the pictures that you see here on the top uh, left, a farmer located in San Juan Bautista um, here in California. He was, I was observing him. He, he was conducting training to his workers. Uh, it was his first time, but with the practice that he did and the training that he received, he did a good job. And now he's able to conduct multiple trainings, you know, with food safety, with safety, and much more, whatever's related to his farm. So having hands on is really important as well, too. We have seen. And here we have Nathan in the middle of the uh, picture connecting the heat stress training. Um, we try to, when we conduct trainings, we try to have a little bit of everybody participate because we don't want to have the same person always talking. It's the same voice uh, that could become boring. We, we want to hear uh, the students or, or farmers hear different voices. On the bottom left picture, this is a picture we did with UC Davis with Heather's team. They came out to Alba as well, and we did group projects together. That's something that we have learned that it's really important that we do our best to, uh, like we mentioned earlier, have that communication, have those groups, interactions really important, and kind of see and observe the, the farmer, kind of see what's their weakness and what's their strength. Because we might observe a farmer who possibly could be shy to speak or needs a little bit more, more support. And we do offer the support to do one-on-one -on -one training with the farmers. And it's not just one time, it's not two times. As many times as they need our support, we will help them out. There's farmers who we have helped out through a whole year, even two years. It consists of one-on-one, 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 -on -one, one -on -one, until they finally get it. There's farmers who actually uh, been through a whole incubator for five years. And after they finished the program, they're out on their own and it took them six years to actually get a full understanding, but it's okay because everybody learns different and everybody has their own place to get things. The bottom right side, um, you can see a farmer on their computer. If you, if there's a farmer that cannot come to us, we'll go to you and we'll provide that one-on-one -on -one assistance. And if you're too far, for example, it could be that you possibly are in Los Angeles or to Sacramento, we will able to create and conduct Zoom trainings if needed, depending on, on the farmer's needs. So we always try to find different strategies to see what fits best for the farmer. Next slide, Nathan. Hi. In our facility in Allo, we conduct daily safety ranch inspections. And what does this mean? That we go to each farmer who's on site and we walk their, their, their farm. I, I did probably mention we have about 30 to 35 incubator farmers. Each farmer runs independently. So we'll go to each farmer and do ranch inspections and safety inspections, food safety inspections, organic practices, multiple, multiple audits that they receive from us. And we do all these audits because we want to make sure the farmers are prepared once they leave our facility. Um, one of the observations we work with is that, for example, you know, on, the, on the right side, you see pallets uh, stacked in the um, on top of pipes, sprinkler pipes. So we pull out our, our forms and we create a, a risk assessment, safety risk assessment observation with the farmer and be like, you know, this is what's going on. What do you see or as a risk? We ask them, we interview them too. We want to hear from them. What did they see instead of us just telling the farmer what's wrong? And then they need a little assistance, we'll help them out. But for example, we see this pallet here that's uh broken, there might be now somebody might step on them or get injured, um, we'll give them a corrective action. And Allo, we, we don't, we'll give a farmer a chance or two to get things, you know, um, ready. But if we see a pattern that there's a farmer that's not complying or, or doesn't want to really follow the rules, most likely next year they will continue in Alba. We really want to make sure that, you know, um, everybody who's in the incubator in, Al in Alba and alumni, they're taking it serious. They really they really want to be responsible 
and they really care about safety. Um, if there's a farmer, an incubator or alumni, that uh, alumni I should say, it's not following uh, safety protocols, then we'll all have to talk to my team and determine if we're gonna provide assistance to a farmer who decides that really they don't they don't care. But I have to say that 90% plus farmers that we, we support, they really do care. They have showed a great um, results in their farms. I'm not sure that you mentioned this earlier, but we have about 60, 80 farmers who are out of the incubator who are now farming on their own and they're executing. You know, they like you said earlier, they started from half an acre. Now they have 15 to 20, up to 30 acres of, of, of that they're farming. And regulations, they have to stay in compliance with safety, food safety, and how we organic, organic regulations. Um, Another observation here, you can see a farmer ended up purchasing an implement and we weren't sure why he ended up purchasing, purchasing this because he, he don't have the proper equipment to utilize this equipment. So we asked him to strap it down correctly, put it in a secure location, and he had one need to correct it. He did. But these are the things that we like to point out. And one thing that we do with the farmers is that we see something wrong with one farmer. We never say names who it was. But we share what the farm, we share with the whole team what we observed. So they could check their area to make sure that this is uh what happened. And let's make sure it's not to happen within our farm. But we just don't share bad news. We also share good news. If we see a farmer doing a good practice, like hey, you know, that this farmer was uh he strapped his truck right, he he uh he, all his workers were lifting properly. Um we noticed that we we checked the farmer's binders and they all their workers received safety trainings. We share that with everybody else. Like, you know, this farmer's doing a really great job. We, we didn't see any implements in the um on the ground that somebody might get injured, become a tripping hazard. So it's not just about sharing bad news, it's about sharing good news too. And communication is very important within each other when it comes to um the farmers, whoever's in charge, where well, there's no communication. Uh, my belief is just not a good program. There has to be a open communication with everybody. Everybody feel comfortable to talk to each other and and find solutions and execute what they're what they're doing. Um, in the upcoming uh days, we have multiple trainings already scheduled um, with the farmers. This is going to be for incubator farmers, but also alumni farmers. And on our schedule, we already have our tractor tractor safety, pesticide, first day CPR proper lifting, and as well, how to use extinguisher um, within uh, the next two, three months already planned out for us to conduct with the farmers. Uh, with that, one of the cool things that we got with the um, UC Davis, we're also going to be able to create an IPP with all the incubator farmers and alumni farmers as well. All these tools that we get, it's really important that we share with the, with the farmers so they can be successful. And once a farmer starts up their business, they see the importance, you know, like, hey, I have to protect my company. Let's make sure we are sitting in compliance. And one thing that I have um, noticed is that as more and more we start inviting farmers who had left and explain to them the importance of them coming to our trainings, they they show up. We have we have our, our numbers of uh, people who had left our incubator, our numbers of uh, alumni who come back to the trainings has has increased. You know, sometimes we fill up the room that we had to split up some uh, some uh, workshops because last time we had about, uh, I would say 60 participants in the room that you can only fit um, 45, 47 um, farmers. So we had to open up all the doors, put chairs outside. But it's great to see these numbers because um, with farmers knowing and and then hearing us talk to them and providing all the technical assistance and making them understand about how important it is to follow up safety regulations, but also explaining why and showing them and stand by their side. They, they really appreciate that. And then they'll hopefully pass on their practice to all their, all their workers. Next, Nathan. Great. Yeah, we're open for questions at this point. Thank you, Antonio. Thank you, Nathan.
Awesome. Thank you so much. Well, I saw several coming in. So why don't we pull down the slides after a moment? Um, I'm guessing people might want to get your contact information. Um, maybe we can also put it into the chat, but we do have some questions. Um, let me make sure I can see them. I just, I am so happy that all of our programming, we've been able to connect and work together because I think what you all are doing is so inspiring and it's great to have that pathway for farm workers into farming um, themselves. And I think that um, it's a vision that uh, is, is really important and not available everywhere. So thank you for that great work. Um, one question that came in has to do with how often you do training. So how do you um, decide the frequency of trainings? And um, and then a follow-up to that is, do you do any um, assessing to see whether or not people are retaining the information that you, you discuss? Great. Yeah, our trainings, uh, we try to have a safety training once a month. Once a month, uh, that's, yes. what was that, I'm sorry? No, you're good, we got you. Okay. Once a month. Um, once once a month, and we try to keep it th to that pace because it's important that there's other trainings that farmers are involved with. You know, we have uh, food safety trainings, we have safety trainings, and uh, and much more like uh, Nathan talked about er uh, earlier, we have uh, marketing classes and so so on and there was one time that we actually had booked for a whole week of trainings and we had to like talk like hey we had to start separating some of the trainings to work with the farmers and be, be flexible um but it's usually every month if it's going to be a hot um we don't try to have the heat stress training in july because we did it before and we heard some complaints from the farmers that why are we conducting the heat stress training in july that we should do it earlier, like in um, March, February, when it's not as warm. And that's what we did this year. We had it a, a lot, a lot earlier. We do ask farmers and get request their feedback. You know, um, what you guys think about the training? Um, what we got, what we guys like us to improve on? Not as often as we should, but that's one of the one of the things we need to work on this year. Do more more surveys because when our food safety trainings. They do require that we do um, evaluations at the end of each training to see what we're doing and where we're at. That's something that we're going to be implementing this year with the farmers as well, connecting more surveys to we want to see where they're at, what their needs are. And it's not, a, you know, we're, it's not about a, a let's let's not let's get scared. And if we do get feed, bad feedback or good feedback, the important if we do give bad feedback, it's now we know what we have to work on to improve on. And so it's really important that yeah we we uh we do those surveys. I'll add on to that if you don't mind, Antonio, about yeah. um how we know whether folks have retained what they learned. And uh oh. yeah, we have the advantage of working with our participants on a you know nearly daily basis. I it's fair to say that Antonio and some of the other teams at Alba do interact with almost every farmer every week. Imagine we have 35 farmers. So uh, we get to see and observe. And um, in order for them to achieve some of the milestones that we require, such as getting their food safety certification or getting their organic certification, they have to implement these practices and they're audited against it. And just to put it in perspective, um, you know, Antonio and his team, Sal and Anna, they do an awful lot on food safety. And um, as part of that process, we actually internally audit through a proper like food safety checklist all of our farmers three times per year that's you know not counting the weekly the typical weekly interaction so um it's very intensive yeah. to provide and but that's what it takes i mean you know if you're a small farm you you don't have departments dedicated to compliance and regulations you're a one man or one woman show right so you have to learn how to do most of it yourself um so anyhow, that's kind of a long-winded way of answering your question, but uh, we just go outside and observe. Yeah, just adding to that, so that I do want to share. Um, we've been having the state uh, go to our farm and also visiting uh, um, our alumni farmers, state of California. We also had the uh, Department of USDA AMS going out there as, as well. And I feel like the uh, food safety and safety are hand by hand. 
because, you know, we also have to check um, for any physical hazards or any chemicals. Uh, trainings, you know, when you're going to apply a, a pesticide, are you pay even trained properly? So, you know, you have a fir first day CPR, depending on the checklist you used. But we had uh, the CDF CDFA go to, go to our uh, facility and they were telling me, like, we'll have to say that all the farmers who are auditing that came out of ALBA, they all have their records on the spot. It's it's all great. And when we have our audits outside of ALBA, I would say 90% of all our farmers always pass their audits. Um, if it's organic, if it's uh, food safety, um, we haven't uh, had a Kelo should come out to visit a farmer because we haven't had an accident. But I have to say that all the records they, they are up to date. Uh, so what kind of what we what we do as well is that we create a binder. We create we create a safety binder for the farmers. So you, you see like um um it's a three week binder. Pretty much we have a, se a section for all the food safety, safety, and organic certifications as well. Um, so we have a pretty good binder. And this goal, this year we also want to do is that, you know, all the farms have uh, poster boards with all the labor laws. Something that I have uh, saw a different company have, and it's always good to uh, share ideas, is that they usually put those poster boards, make it into a binder so they can have it on hand. So we want to create... um poster boards, but at a binder size, so they could just carry it on their working trucks that way they're, they're available at all times. That's great. Those are all really, really helpful ideas. I think that for us who work with um, growers, employers, farm workers, it's always good to hear some of those really practical examples of things that are working in, you know, in workplaces. Um, so you you spoke a little bit of the to this, but what uh, what kinds of trainings do you think are the most effective? You said that sometimes you know people are tired and don't want to do a PowerPoint. So what what are the most effective ways that, regardless of topic, you have found to conduct trainings? One of the uh, main things that I have that I have seen that work better, you you kind of have to evaluate what works best for the farmers. One thing that we did notice is that having trainings on Thursdays and Fridays we get the lowest participation um, because a lot of the farmers are doing farmer's markets mm -hmm. or they're finishing up the week. Um, I, What I did is I contacted a single farmer and I asked them what works best for you. So kind of from getting the the, the proper time, and, the times and days, everybody, majority, I would say, requested Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesdays um, to conduct at night. We do try to be flexible, not do it too late, maybe like around 5 p.m., and the reason why, because if it's like court six or seven, you know, farmers want to go home and to their to their families. Um, when it's a, a, a PowerPoint presentation, just strictly that, I noticed I could see farmers trying to like get sleepy, their eyes are closing. So it's, you know, um, really important that any type of a, a PowerPoint presentation you do, try to mix it, you know, maybe like every 15, 20 minutes uh, stop and have them interact or ask them questions, you know, have some food available for the farmers so they could, uh, you know, relax a little bit, some coffee. But what I think, one of the things that I want to improve on myself as with, with my team is that being more effective is having the farmers interact with each other and have them participate and mix it up. It's not about, you have to share that information with the farmer, but quiz them, stop them, you know, have them stand up and sit down, kind of, um, Something I saw when we went to the um, in Monterey, oh, Ag -Safe. Next, Ag -Safe. Yeah. one of our trainings that we, we received was that the farmer was uh, the instructors were asking questions to the to the students like, what do we talk about? What did you learn about this topic? And it kind of keeps you like, oh wow, they're going to be asking us questions. You know, let's we have to make sure we're paying attention. I think having interacting a lot of interaction with the farmers it's very important very important because I seen groups of uh, uh I seen trainers with a group and half the uh when they're doing tailgate meetings half the the farmers they're looking the other way and then you have the other farmers just like reading off a paper and here you go sign here you know it's important that you know you if it's uh if you have a crew of 40 possibly split them up two different times 
because uh, smaller classes are, are I think I think they're better and that's something that as well we need to make sure we're not overcrowding the classes and not not, want, not everybody's listening and in, yeah encourage farmers to participate interact with each other and one thing that I want to do uh, as well is that after we went to the act safe you know have a quiz at the end let them know we're going to have a quiz we're going to have a quiz and it's going to get greater I would add to that too you know it's uh these trainings can be looked at as a team building opportunity because a lot of them are by their nature interactive. Um, if you're doing something like a fire extinguisher trainer and you're outside and you have to, you know, take turns putting out a fire, like it's, it's serious not to be taken lightly, but it can also be fun and you get to know each other. You break down some of the barriers. Um, sometimes like we do do this sometimes when we have staff and farmers learning together showing them that we care and that um and we have this similar kind of interaction with our, our participants where we're like engaged in activity together learning side by side so um that's been important also um antonio hinted at this earlier but our situation is unique we have to kind of toe this line of being a, a landlord that has rules um a training organization we used to even market our farmers products which was like unbearable to have three things like that that are all kind of dicey in their own way um so anyhow we have to kind of do the carrot and the stick approach um which means when we can bring in you know experts from uc davis or a consultant that we work with or somebody from the government that likewise says hey this is important this is what happens if you don't do this this is you know some of the incidences we have seen these are what the fines are like um just helps reinforce the message, right? And not make it seem like, oh, this is just Alba's deal. No, this is the law or, you know, this is industry accepted practice. So those are a couple of things that I, I think are pretty important. Yeah, that's really helpful. I, I like that perspective. Um, so given that they are relatively small plots of land and farms, I'm curious whether or not, it, if if the farmer also has some hired workers, so some farm workers working with them on the land, do you typically have everybody coming to trainings together um, and have that kind of cross talk back and forth between workers and, and farmers or employers, or do you, or do they tend to um, train their own staff themselves? Most of the farms. So, you know, everyone's starting off on a half acre. Um, really, it takes the help of a family to kind of get it up and going. So a lot of times it's like a husband and wife team. They're going after it half time or part time, you know, um, when they're done with their day jobs and they put in a tremendous amount of work. I mean, it's imagine working 50 hours a week and then coming on your time off to launch a small farm and putting in another, you know, 20 to 40 hours a week on that. Um, so it just shows how hungry they are for this opportunity. But um, yeah, as they scale up, they often have to hire people, right? Contractor, contracted labor, or even get to hiring a permanent employee. Um, at the end of the day, it's, you know, they're independent businesses with us. It's their responsibility to follow the laws and make sure that their employees are trained. But we encourage them to bring their employees. Um, we've offered to do training specifically for employees too, because, um, well, we want to empower them though to be able to do it themselves because they're not going to be with us forever right and uh that's the goal right Jump into you, that, Nathan. yeah go um, for it yeah that that's what they great they just play it really, really clearly sorry <laughs> um we do yeah farmers start off like you said at first they don't really need they don't have that much uh employees or uh, workers helping them on their farm but once they leave the incubator um there's farmers who have about 15 20 acres they do get uh employees so kind of what I have I've done, for example, there's a farm, there's a farmer who got land in Soledad and they got 22 acres. And these two farmers are incubated. They're farmers who graduated our program. They're all going to get um, about 11.5 or 11 acres each. So they're going to have workers. So kind of what I mentioned to them is that, you know, we could actually have a training here in your farm, but how you're here in, in uh, this area, there's uh, more farmers in Soledad that are left for incubator. So how about, you know, we come, we meet in your farm and we invite your inc the other farmers to your farm. 
we could start like a little group of 10, 10, 15, 10, 15 workers. Um, and we could just conduct the power presentation out on the farms, have hands-on training. Um, as well, like so I try to I try to see where our alumni are and if we could get about even if it's two, three farmers in one location, I'll go to their to their farm and we could um conduct some trainings out there as well. That's great. Yeah. And I think having people from multiple workplaces also that you have that knowledge sharing opportunity, Nathan, you were sort of alluding to that, the team building piece. Um, you know, I know that in our trainings, our trainers like to have multiple people or people from multiple businesses or farms because you have different experiences, different knowledge to share. Um, yeah, that's a great point, Heather. I mean, um, you know, I'm, I'm humbled year after year about what I learned from our participants and to put it in perspective, you know, when people are training to launch a farm and we're going to go cover something like irrigate, like putting together an irrigation system, you know, obviously we have staff that knows how to do that, but we have farmers that have been people coming to us that have been doing that for 20 years or something. Right. I mean, who better to tap? So I, I like to think of our participants as instructors, as much as us in a lot of ways. And so I, I do have one more question, although that would have been an amazing place to end because I mean, I think that you're <laughs> right. They are the workers themselves are experts in the work and engaging them is um, is such a critical strategy. Um, but being the, having the focus on health and safety and um, and thinking about some of the uniqueness of having uh, working on small farms, curious what you would each say are some of the biggest hazards either currently or like safety issues you're hoping to address in the future um, with your with the farmers in your program. You want to go for that one, Antonio? Sure. Um, I would have to say what I want to make sure farmers are doing. I'll say number one thing, seatbelts while using the tractor. That's my number one thing that I've been um, reminding farmers. The seatbelt is really important. Um, it's so easy to jump jump on a tractor, and just take off, right? We have to remind farmers uh, about the seatbelt and making sure they know how to use the implements because it's so it's so easy to get hurt with the implements. That's Doesn't so work. that's so good. I'm sorry, Nathan. Go ahead. Uh, I, you know, just one thing that came to mind and it's something we've been working on for a long time because we have new participants every year, right? So it's, um, we take 10 to 12 in the incubator and then we graduate off five to eight every year. So it's a constant cycle, but, um, it's something I feel strongly about is just trying to keep the kids that come to our farm safe. Um, we had a special project where we looked at children's safety and did a bunch of research and, um, worked with the Marshfield Institute back east and uh you know just empowering families to know what they need to do to keep their kids safe and what's kind of give them some guidance on what age appropriate work might look like um i think we made a lot of progress uh, one of which is just we don't let kids under eight into the fields period um which is a hard thing at the time because like kids love farms and tractors and all that but um you know we're just constantly trying to nudge what we do in a safer direction right that's fabulous. Well, I think on that note, we will wrap up um, and thank you both so much. Um, and I know that Antonio has already done or plans to um, remind everybody that you all work with that it is going to be extremely hot over the next few days. And so heat um, safety um, and, you know, a lot of good cool water, shade, et cetera, is essential um, for all of us across the state because it, it sounds like it's going to be hot everywhere. Um, thank you both so much. I, I'm really thankful that I have the opportunity to work with you on a regular basis um, because of some of our funding and um, knowing how to specifically train and, and reach small farmers is essential because the approaches oftentimes need to be different than um, organizing companies that have their own safety officers and HR teams and, and the infrastructure um, that might be able to carry on those duties. So thank you again. And everybody, this is our last seminar for the, the year. We will be back in October um, 2024. So about four months. Enjoy your summer break. And we will see you all later. Thanks so much. Thanks a lot.